Welcome everyone to Google Summer of Code office hours. It's the 24th of March. Thanks for being here. Uh, yes, reminder, let's behave according to the Jenkins code of conduct, be nice to each other. Sagar, I believe you had a question or you had, you wanted to share with us some progress you've made on your proposal. So, and we've got Gareth on the line who, can, who may be able to help and guide. Yeah, so I made a proposal for the Cloud Events plugin for Jenkins. And uh, um, basically in that plugin, there are mainly two modules, the emitter and the listener one. And uh, and I made a, I made the proposal um, the, for the first module um, with um, by looking into the first I looked in the source code of the statics gatherer plugin and I made it with respect to that because our plugin is mostly like that so I shared my uh, Google Doc in the chat link maybe you can look at look at it yeah that would be good. Excellent, thank you. So, and that's that's a that's a good behavior that we want to reinforce. The sooner we get publicly shared project proposals, the more effective we can be as reviewers of those project proposals to help guide you. And others can look at them and say, ah, yes, that's how a good project proposal works. Or look, here's what the feedback was from the reviewers on that project proposal. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, regarding that proposal, uh, hello everyone. Hello. Uh, like uh, I'm working on uh, the plugin, like uh, plugin tool, uh, plugin manager tool improvement. That project idea. So on that idea, like uh, there are various issues which are mentioned, like which are labeled as enhancement on the issue, like GitHub issue tracker. So uh, Oleg, I'm uh, sorry, Oleg, not. Mark, can you like give me some uh, idea like uh, how many issues should I target for this GSOC like this year? Uh, there are I around think, seven. And, and I think that's that's up to you. Explore them. See what what you think it might take. You're the best estimator of what you think you should put into the project proposal. And plugin installation manager is a particularly interesting one because it is increasing use in the Docker images. We're using it more and more. In fact, we've got a pull request right now proposing to completely replace the, the old way of doing things, it was a shell script with plugin installation yeah. manager. So do some experiments and use those to estimate for yourself which things you think you should include in your project. Okay, like, but uh, can you just still give me an uh, ideal number? Like, what would you suggest? Because I, because uh, like, I feel if I give a very less number, like, uh, just two or three issues which I feel that I can solve, then, uh, like, I don't, I like any expectations which uh, the community has or the mentors have, anything like that. I actually know, and, and let me, I've got Rishab on the, on the call. So, so this is a great yeah, excuse sure. to explain why there isn't an expectation. So Rishab last year worked on one issue, right? One issue, it was improve the performance of the Git plugin. That was one. Uh -huh. And that one issue took full time for four months, wasn't it Rishab? I mean, we yeah, spent, we spent, he spent months on that one issue. So, so if it's one and it's a big one, that's perfectly yeah. fine. If it's several small, that's also okay. So, and and the other is Google Summer of Code allows that we can adapt and refine as we go through it. So again, to Rishab as the example, last year we discovered roughly halfway through that we had not done nearly a good enough job of describing things at the beginning. And Rishab had to do a bunch of research, right? He had to do creative, very, very challenging question answering and he did very well at it, but it's there is some flexibility there. Better for you, this, yeah. the more you do in advance, and that was another thing we learned with Rishab, right? It's better that we do more things in advance during this preparation phase, but yeah. but a few is is okay. Uh, if they're given plugin installation managers relative relatively new state, I would make a guess that you could do three or four because you'll find some of them will be easy some of them will be yeah. more difficult and that's okay. They're like, there are some of the issues with just say to replace the, uh, like uh, replace simple system dot out, uh, system dot out print line commands with the logging, like logger class, like create a logger class and all that. So some of some of the issues are like that. So yeah, I'll, right. I'll take into that. Okay. Okay, well, thanks and, for and the I, insight. 
I think that's a that's a good way showing in your project plan that you have looked at the issues, thought about them, and considered which ones you should do in which sequence, is a good as a good indicator. Oh, I've thought about this, and I would do this one first because it looks a little easier. I would do this one next because I would develop more skills and be able to work on it next. So yeah, that will it. So like I can write all of this in my timeline. Like no, what what trip? Okay. Right. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Rishab, for being the example, yeah. by, by the way. Much appreciated. No, that's, yeah, that's, uh, yeah th th thank, thank you. Thank you so much, so Rishab. Right. Thank you. No, thank you so much. I, I just wanted to add one thing uh, to what Mark said. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, here, that um, if you see, let's say, 10 issues for a particular project, uh, the priority should be um, done on the basis of the uh, community value which you will provide by solving any of these issues. So if you understand the plugin well, I am assuming that you will be able to understand that if you fix a certain issue, you will be able to give a certain amount of value to the community which who is using it. So that is how you should prioritize your issues and that is how you should, I think, plan your proposal. Like for my project, well, thank you it was so very much. clear that uh, we had one problem, which if we are able to solve uh, correctly, uh, we will be able to give uh, uh, like like huge benefits to the users. But that was dependent on our uh, project, of course, but that was clear uh, from the uh, beginning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I took. Actually, it's a very good point to like look up to for the issues, uh, which whichever. Uh, uh, impacts the community most, I should uh, go for those first. Thank you. Thank you so much for the insight. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Um, I have a question, but that's regarding the related code. Uh, so is it fine? Is, uh, so. Um, is it fine to ask here? I mean, it's more like of a coding question. Okay. okay. So, so um, I have a question regarding um, in the statics gatherer plugin. There is one class named um, property loader, which so which is actually um, I guess yeah um, the whatever the endpoints is being saved by the user um, from um, where to send all those all those statics um, is being sent. So how um, or where all that data is being saved by the Jenkins? Um, maybe I didn't explain it very well, um, but I can share that particular class um, on the Git. Um, yeah, let me show. I presume it's down to sort of it's like global plugin configuration, isn't it? Um, for, for emitting events, mm -hmm. we need to have a, an endpoint, I presume. And I don't know whether it's just a simple webhook endpoint. I don't know whether we need to do any signing of events to make sure they're not manipulated. Um, and I don't know whether there's any PLS configuration we would need to do to sort of say we need to verify or not. Um, so this, I think there's quite a good example of that that, that, that um, has just been added to the Tekton client plugin um, of global configuration for saving instances, uh, saving information about the, the Tekton cluster. Um, so I think there's some stuff in there that might be might be handy. Mm -hmm. okay. So so looking at the specific code that you that you shared, so I got, that that looks like. It is a, a data object that's yeah loading data from a a resource bundle, and then I assume has the I don't see anything immediately that saves it back. So it looks like it's it's taking in data, but it um, I don't see anything on it. it, 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 it I was going to say well, it looks like it's um. Yeah, there's the re loads it from the resource bundle, which has the sort of defaults. And then there are system properties and environment variable overrides 
for each of those things. So I think it's like a helper class that they Got it. the guest staff. Um, a helper class for in, yeah. To, to, to yeah, get that sort of hierarchy of resource, system, property, environment, variable. I don't know. I'm not sure whether which way around they are, but yeah. So it's kind of help, helper class for getting the data which is being saved by the user, is it? Um, uh, in the global, in the glo which which are basically um, endpoints which is being set as a global, yeah, global configuration yeah. for that. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because while designing the high level of that particular module, I just saw this like it is being used by so many places um, just to um, get the endpoint which is being saved by the user for, for example, build step. Yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, thank you. And so, so Gareth, just for my benefit, that's that's a pattern that in my inexperience, I hadn't seen before. So it, as you were saying, it appears to be using bringing default settings in from a property file that's built with the package with the plugin, and then allows the user to, to alter those default settings. And, and it, retain, it remembers the altered settings. Did I understand what you were describing? I think so. Yeah, it looks like it looks like it, it, it seems to give a bit of a so it's like if I'm looking at sort of one of the values, uh, I don't know, AWS region, for instance, it tries to load it from the configuration, which if it's set that it returns that, otherwise it tries to um, get it from an environment variable. Mm. So it's an environment property, but I think environment property could be a system property or a environment variable or even a something in the resource bundle. There's a hierarchy in there. So it looks like there's like four places that it could, it goes to to try to look at these things one at a time. Thank you. Uh, and so presumably because it's looking at the actual system configuration first, anything that you've set in there is going to override it. But I suppose it's there to give you kind of sensible defaults for all of the values that you'll need, which, which sounds good. Although like, I don't know how you would do that for a webhook URL because we have no way of guessing what a sensible default for that would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. And what's the purpose? There is one class which is also uh, which is exactly log back. Um, log back. Is it is that term um, is a uh, is familiar with Jenkins while making any plugin? Is it uh, log back particularly, which is also been used? Um, yeah, log back is a logging framework, but um, mm -hmm. I know that you can use log back to send log of it, log messages to a HTTP endpoint. So I'm wondering whether that's if that's what it is. Um, uh, I think it's think of it. It's just configuration properties. It's kind of a way of abstracting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. um. Gareth. Um. Just. Uh, just. Just specific. Um. In property loader. Dot Java. I just wanna know the functionality of. Um. Get build set. Get build step endpoint. I mean that function um what uh, what exactly that actually doing i'm just uh, i'm unable to understand it exactly um there is a one fu function on line number 115 um get build step endpoint maybe um that's enough for me for that class to understand what is it doing yeah so it, it's it's loading um it's doing that static statistics configuration dot get which is a way of kind of like loading that global configuration class mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah and that will be based on the you know Jenkins of XML files that it stores on the disk and then from that it's calling a property you know get build step URL so that's the particular property that it's getting now if that has been set it's going to return that mm -hmm. 
if it's not been set, it's going to go into that get environment property function. Um, and that get environment property function um, basically call, it, it calls the get instance get property and that get property um, can look at, it looks at environment variables first, I think, and it's resource bundles next. So, yeah. so that's that's pro providing an a high, the what you were describing earlier is the hierarchy of overriding, right? So, plugin yeah. defaults are lowest priority. It looks like, and then if I set something as a property starting Jenkins or in an environment variable to match this, it would use that instead. Did I did I understand that correctly, Gira? Yes, and I think at the highest level, it's whatever configuration you've actually entered in on the global configuration. Mm -hmm. Page. Which it, it sounds it sounds like quite a nice sensible hierarchy of stuff really. Mm -hmm. no, it, it, it looks like a, it looks like it looks like a good pattern to use for this type of global configuration information. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if the Jenkins documentation actually goes into this level of detail. For global config. Not, not uh, as far as I know. Uh, it seems like a, it. It looks like a very good pattern. It certainly does. I'm wondering if there is a recommended hierarchy of properties and overrides to use. Mm -hmm. I know different plugins have maybe slightly different conventions. I'm not sure what the Jenkins best practice is for that. Right. So it's just basically a hierarchy where people are just overriding and Jenkins is going to use that particular design. Yeah. Got it, yeah. I'm just correctly writing the high level, so that would be, yeah. Because the other thing you'll want is, I mean, there's obviously that statistics configuration class. You'll want your own version of that. Um, and that will need to work with, or you will want that to work with JCASC as well. So there are particular guidelines for making sure that that global configuration ends up in, or is compatible with the configuration as code plugin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions, Sagar, or or mm -hmm. others? This open, we're intentionally open forum here, and we want if you have questions, by all means, don't be shy. Ask them, and let's let's have a discussion about them. So, well, one other thing ahead. I would recommend is to make this when when you think you've got um, enough for like a, a first release, or not even not not a version one release, but like it's. It's enough to be um, trying out on a Jenkins server, um, and you want it to you, know, you want to start giving that a go. Um, if you, if, I'm happy if you want to reach out and we can I can show you the JEP 229 stuff that we're doing on the Tekton client plugin, where every every interesting merge to master creates a new release automatically, and that release is uploaded and it happens directly from GitHub. So it's quite it's quite nice. I like that. That's that's a very good idea. So so just to reinforce what Gareth was saying, we now have a facility that is being more actively used in the Jenkins project where you can allow automatic release of next version of your plugin, next version of your component just by either using a specific label on the on the commit on the pull request that you merged or if I remember correctly, is it also tag dependent? I know labels will do it. All I have to do is do a label. Yeah, it, it, it's the interesting label thing. It, 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 it's part of release drafters um, notion of an interesting category. Um, mm. So anything that's marked as a bug or an, a, an enhancement or a feature or something like that will automatically get a release created when that feature is when that pull request is merged. Um, and the reason that's done is so that there's there's not a 
large amount of churn when it comes to things like dependency updates or documentation updates or things like that. Um, yeah, Oleg, and, you can, and, Oleg can correct me if I've got that wrong, but I think <laughs> that is <laughs> what it's there for. So I'm, I'm one of the fortunate users of that particular thing. I converted one of the plugins that I maintain to use JET 229 and have been delighted with the results. I make a change that is irrelevant and it doesn't release it because I labeled it appropriately. When I want to release it, I just label it and it releases. It's, I didn't have to do anything more than, than merge the pull request. Mm -hmm. And um, it's actually a very important part of the current Genix community discussions because uh, software delivery pipelines uh, become a really important topic uh, this month uh, after the solar winds hacks and previous hacks before. So in the case of Jenkins project, we also have, want to have a rock solid delivery pipeline. And, and there are some opportunities for improvement. Uh, we have been discussing the previous contributor summit and we'll keep discussing in the future. Okay. Other questions? I have a question. So what if we repeat uh, the today's session, maybe as Jenkins online meetup uh, early next week? Uh, we've been doing a session at um, a Spring of Code for presenting uh, uh, Jenkins and contributing to Jenkins. So maybe we could um, repeat uh, the same one as Jenkins online meetup without much additional effort. I like that. So, so your the concept would be we host a a uh, Jenkins online meetup. I assume we would want to do it earlier hours. So, roughly the time when we yep. we did the the code for cause uh, session earlier. So, do it early uh, earlier hours and mm -hmm. invite. How would you envision that? Invite panelists who are mentors or yep. panelists. So basically, what we were doing last year is at uh, JSOC office hours. So, and at Hacktoberfest openings, etc. So having a quick introduction and then um, letting mentors uh, to present their projects and uh, having a long q &A session. Oh, that would be fun. So Gareth, I guess this is a question to you then. As a mentor, would you be willing to present something on a potential, you're a potential mentor for Tekton client, I believe you may also be a potential mentor for cloud events. Would you be willing to present, Oleg, are you envisioning like five minutes for two or three minutes, 30 seconds? How much time do I have to present the Git credentials thing, for instance? Well, we can uh, discuss that, but yeah, I think that five minutes would be all, okay. give or take. And then after the brief presentations of the project ideas, we would allow panel discussion or allow questions from the, the, the audience. Is that the idea? Yeah. So okay. basically uh, the same how we were doing featured projects at Hacktoberfest openings, uh, hackathons, etc. So, okay, if I ask, so Sagar, Himanshu and Raghav, would you be interested in participating in that kind of thing? And would you be willing to bring your questions there so that we could, we could answer your questions there? Yeah, sure. Well, it's probably yeah, for sure. No sure. Use case because for those students who have already reached out to the project uh, and uh, who are working on project ideas, who are reaching out uh, uh, to um, seeks and uh, potential mentors, uh, for you, well, this session might be informative, but I don't think that it will be that informative. It's rather for students who start later. Because historically, what we have, uh, there is uh, there are a few dozens of students who reach out earlier, and uh, there are also uh, up to 100 students uh, reaching out in uh, the last two weeks. So, well, from what I can tell, uh, usually uh, almost every student we've accepted has reached out to us earlier. Uh, but still, there is a high demand in uh, these introductions, etc. And by doing online uh, webinar, uh, we could actually. Um, address of this topic. So, uh, I think that uh, it will be the main target audience. 
I like that. I would love the opportunity to shamelessly promote why I think the Git Credentials project idea is the best project idea. Okay. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. So, okay, uh, we'll check calendars uh, and uh, schedule something. So no need in timely announcement. We can do it on Monday or Tuesday. Tuesday would be back. I'm out on Monday, but that's cool. Okay, Tuesday, Tisa, then uh, I will find a slot. Yeah, and uh, don't, don't be shy about early. Uh, given the number of students that we've got, I assume Sagar, Himanshu, and Raghav, that you're, you're all from somewhere on the Indian subcontinent. And therefore, if we bias towards earlier in the day in Europe time, that's less, less late in your night time. No, it depends because you know, the schedules uh, are crazy for everyone. So usually we are targeting the evening in Asian and Pacific region because uh, yeah, there is still study at this time. So that uh, we are targeting evenings. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, now with COVID situation, yeah, it looks like everyone uh, either studies or works full time, except ones who have babies. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So on that note, uh, okay, I'll find the slot. Great. So any other topics or questions for today? Uh, actually, I have a few questions uh, regarding that plugin installation manager tool enhancement, like the issues which are labeled as enhancement. Uh, I was like looking into what I can uh, work on. Uh, there were there was one issue, uh, split CLI to sub commands and migrate, migrate to Pico CLI. Like I did not understand by what did you mean by sub commands? Like what was okay. the uh, So plugin installation manager tool it actually serves multiple purposes. So firstly, you can upgrade plugins, but also there is, for example, command to check for upgrades, uh, just list available updates, um, yeah. or for example, uh, to print help, etc. And historically, when uh, these CLI interfaces uh, include multiple actions, they tend to be overcomplicated. And actually, a plugin installation manager is a good example of that. Just a second, I can show it to you. Um, so well, uh, just need to close a few windows. Okay, I can see screen share. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so we go to the plugin installation manager code base. And currently, if you go to plugin manager CLI, you can find that, uh, yeah, there is uh, LA options class. And here you can find uh, a bunch of different options. So some yeah. options uh, conflict with each other. Some options are applicable only for particular use case. Um, for example, no download is basically the flag which converts uh, installation to dry run when you do not install updates. Uh, or for example, uh, the additional flags, etc. So what uh, could be done instead? You could uh, split it to multiple commands. For example, install plugins, check updates, let's say print help, mm -hmm. verify plugins txt, upgrade, uh, or something like that. So basically, uh, cool. more atomic commands which uh, take different arguments so that uh, they're isolated and uh, it will be much easier for end users to understand this interface and to use it. Okay, like so multiple flags in one command, uh, like flag. Okay. Yeah. So, like, uh, it's not yet implemented, and uh, that issue pertains to that. Like, uh, we, uh, you want, uh, or like, the com community wants to implement that, like, more than one command uh, being able to run that. Yeah, because it also helps not only with uh, these interfaces, but also with uh, code quality. So, for example, I did uh, the same conversion for Jenkins File Runner project. Yeah, I saw that your group, like, uh, you had also mentioned when. Google group uh, conversation. Yeah, I can just show you all the yeah, requests. Exactly. 
what this is. Uh, yeah, this one. So here, for example, what you can see that, uh, yeah, apart from the documentation and other things, so you can see that I split uh, one interface uh, to multiple subcommands like run CLI, list plugins, generate completion, etc. So it's also embedded in the CLI. And here, for example, uh, what I was able to do, so I had one uh, mega con uh, class with all configurations. I was able to split it to multiple ones. So basically, uh, there is a uh, better encapsulation now, and uh, you can find uh, interfaces, pass them properly through the code, and then uh, basically the code will be significant. Yeah. So for example, here, yeah, there is a generic Jenkins launcher command. It's command which takes the Jenkins launcher options. So you can see that it's an abstract class. So basically, I defined a group of options, and then every command which launches a real uh, Jenkins instance within a Jenkins file runner, it uh, just uh, extends uh, this class, and then it uh, basically gets all these parameters. So here, for example, uh, run CLI command. So basically, it's command which uh, runs command line interface where you can interact with Jenkins file runner in Kubi. And you can see that it basically just up plus name uh, to be triggered, but all parameters are taken from upstream. And there is uh, another Jenkins uh, launcher command, which uh, basically uh, takes the Jenkins launcher parameters and it also takes the pipeline run options because it needs to run pipeline. And again, uh, since it's separate classes, etc., the code is much more readable and maintainable. Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah, like uh, I actually I don't understand much about Jenkins file runner, but I understand what you're trying to say. Like you created something as some abstract classes, and then you are uh, extending that class into different type files and creating different options for them. So it makes yeah. more intuitive for you. So basically, I applied the object-oriented programming to the common line interface yeah. definitions, yeah, yeah, yeah. so that they yeah. can be reused easily. So, so Oleg, one of the things that, that I had not considered that I think you were just describing is that what are many, many very small, fine-grained detail options today in, in the plugin installation manager tool would be presented to the user better as higher level concepts like uh, download or Upgrade. Could you describe some of those higher level concepts again? It was, I, I, I'm not sure I got them all. Okay, was... So, for example, uh, it's uh, tall plugins. So, it's basically the current behavior when you pass uh, plugins to it, it installs uh, the plugins you request. Also, you can uh, just ask uh, it to show upgrades. So, for example, it shows you available. Uh, updates uh, for your plugin txt uh, related security issues it's what we already support in this plugin installation manager after json but also you can uh, add a command which actually patches your plugin txt without downloading files or you can uh, add a command uh, which uh, verifies that uh, the current uh, plugin versions are compatible with uh, the desired jenkins core so there is a lot of different opportunities for this CLI tools to extend, uh, but yeah, currently it's barely maintainable because in addition to these uh, few hundreds, but few lines of parameters, actually there is a lot of um, hoops you need to go through in order to pass them uh, within the system because you need to convert uh, these parameters uh, to just pass them between different invocation layers. And finally, every pull request which adds additional option uh, becomes a kind of pain. Uh, so I can find a few examples. So for example, uh, we know that, for example, uh, Plugin installation manager doesn't doesn't support proxy statements now, and it would require several additional parameters. Um, okay, so here it supports for Jenkins version argument. Uh, so it's just an example where you would probably want to just uh, a few lines of code, but you can see that it's actually one kind of secret. Because here we added additional option. Then uh, I need to pass uh, this option to configuration builder. Uh, it's a class in the plugin installation manager library. So you can see that uh, uh, there is 
method, uh, which I passed to downstream. There is also getter method because it's used in tests. Uh, then, for example, here, version number and there is because I need to convert parameter to the right format. Uh, and then if you scroll down, you can see that the results configuration uh, file in the library, which also includes version number, which you pass through constructor, and then you extract it through getter. Uh, so that uh, somewhere uh, inside the code, inside the plugin manager implementation, it finally reads this version and does something. So all this uh, chain of various code, yeah, you can get a lot of uh, code lines, but actually it's a waste of time if you have proper interfaces and if you can uh, pass to them uh, within the system. So by using proper uh, SLI interface, you could actually achieve that easily. So Pico CLI like uh, comes into help like I have not uh, used or developed anything in Pico CLI at the moment, so I don't know much about that. But it will come like it uh, provides APIs to uh, just implement that to get yeah. a higher level. Access. Yeah, right. Okay, uh, like so I'll have to. Currently in Jenkins, in the majority of components, we use library called Arcs for G. So Arcs for G yeah, yeah, yeah. is basically. Well, a quite old library created by Kosike when he was working on Hudson and other projects. And uh, well, this library is totally relevant. Uh, it can be used, but at the same time, uh, yeah, there are more libraries. And for example, Pika CLI has a lot of advantages because, for example, it's natively integrated with Quarkus framework. So um, you can achieve much better performance in the cloud native applications with that. Uh, it's, it also has more modern interfaces, etc. And when we were discussing what CLI library we want to use as a general recommendation in the community, we agreed that we would rather recommend Pika CLI than Arts4G for new development. So yep, yep, yeah, Arts4G so. is uh, still totally relevant. It's also uh, a Rambus library. It has its own uh, issues. For example, Arts4G doesn't verify duplicate parameters. And uh, well, sometimes we had issues with that. Uh, but yeah, Pika CLI is basically more advanced version of this library. All right. So, like, I'll go into more details of how I can use Pico CLI for the better. Uh, uh, earlier, you were showing that PR there. You mentioned one. Like, I, I have also messaged this to you in Gitter, but uh, I think you were. There was one line which you said uh, using version number library. I mean, this is not much related with the issue as such, but it is related with the project. So I wanted to like work. Uh, there is one comment which you had said to do version number. Mm, version number. Okay. Well, it was it was just on screen there. Oh, like. Uh, yeah, okay. it didn't help me. Uh, yeah, yeah, it has yeah, until yeah. version number. Right. So it's uh, another so, library okay. uh, within Jenkins project. Uh, so why it's a separate library? Because we use it in multiple components, not only in the Jenkins core, but also in slide tools like plugin installation manager and Jenkins infrastructure, etc. So it's basically a standalone library which has not that much quotes inside. Uh, it has actually just a few classes. So one is version number. It's a class which supports parsing version from different formats and comparing these versions so that we can see which version is newer, etc. So yeah, this is basically this class. And uh, recently we added a similar class for Java specification version when we work on uh, uh, Java 11 support because uh, Java has implemented change in the version formats. So in order to properly compare the versions and uh, the operations with them, you basically get some uh, additional code which processes the version, especially if they mistakes. Because, uh, for example, what we did is that uh, some uh, uh, developers used to call uh, Java uh, 10, 1.10, and 1.10 yeah, is yeah. lower than 9. So standard comparison wouldn't work there if we were not normalizing the Java versions. And at some point, we introduced this class. But basically, that's it. Uh, so it's just a few classes, but yeah, it can be improved if needed. OK. 
Okay, so I just uh, like uh, I saw a use of that. Like I thought maybe there's something to work upon, like some kind of minor issue type, like so that I can get going in contributing to plugin installation manager for that. Yeah, there was uh, you can start from there. So there's a number of library. Yeah, there might be some improvements, but it's generally a really small piece of code. So yeah, I don't think that there are issues in this library process. So obviously, you can say that, hey, your Java version format doesn't support Java 17. I guess it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah because I, well, when I was working on that, there was no even Java 11. So yeah, you can do something like that. But yeah, it's not a big need for this type. Yeah, like uh, not specifically to this library. I think some there was some uh, use of this library in Java, like not Java plugin installation manager. So I think there was something. Okay, so mm -hmm. were you mentioning like were you like you mentioned wrote a comment over there and uh, were you like uh, saying uh, to improve this library, not the plugin installation manager? Because I thought you were talking about improving the library, plugin installation manager, not version number library. I, actually, uh, I have linked the comment. If you can just uh, go to the greater channel, I have linked uh, to that specific comment. Okay. Uh, not yeah in the. Uh, yeah, uh, I see. So it was today, and I haven't seen. Yeah, like seen. I can understand that uh, you were in the. At spring. Okay, so this comment is about moving to version number leap. So basically, yeah, there is this class which seems to be generic enough. So maybe it makes sense to move it uh, from uh, um, this uh, tool uh, right uh, inside uh, the version number of library. So that, for example, if we specify versions using graphics for G for other use cases, it can be used from the library. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not like I must have conversion. It's just uh, to do comment for the future. There is just case for that. And again, uh, this is for arcs for G, and uh, okay. for uh, uh, if we take uh, talk about PCLI, there is version number handler, which is basically the same, but uh, for um, uh, for PCLI. So, for example, uh, you could use uh, this uh, handler instead of uh, the parts that are implemented for plugin installation manager. Okay, like I'll, then I'll have to see the APIs of Pico Scaler, like version and all that. Yeah. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's one issue which I do not understand at all. The issue is the add support for generating a new plugin file based on current Jenkins folder. Like, uh, it's uh, issue number. It's uh, in the plugin installation manager, right? Uh, in the project ID, right? Or in... okay. Here. In the uh, GitHub uh, repo. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, for yeah. example, you want to migrate it's existing Jenkins. Jenkins. I'm not that one. Uh, Okay, just a second. Uh, actually, not that one now. If you can just filter it by filter the labels by enhancement, like uh, it'll reduce a lot of things. Enhancement. And uh, add support for generating it. I did yeah. not understand this. Part. Okay. So basically, uh, there is a Jenkins folder uh, which includes plugins. So when you install Jenkins, when you configure that, it has a folder which lists all plugin files. And what team okay. uh, wants here is to be able to read uh, this directory and to generate a plugin list from that, so that uh, it can be later converted to the configuration as code. Okay, so, so generate uh, a YAML. YAML based, like, sorry, uh, YAML type file uh, of all the plugins that are yeah. there in the folder. Exactly. Okay. So it's basically needed for migration. So when you move your existing instance to configuration as code, you use, uh, you can use this tool. And yeah, probably it could be additional sub command 
which actually reads the directory and uh, yeah, creates a file for you so that you just add it to a CM and can use it uh, going forward. Okay, okay. I like now in this channel better. Thank you. Thank you for this. Mm -hmm. One more thing, if you if you still have time, <laughs> sorry, like I'm taking too much time today. Uh, like uh, continuing into the issues, not not in this issue. There is one more issue. Uh, the issue is add support for Jenkins BOM as a source of plugin versions when using YAML or text. Okay. Bond. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is created by me. So yeah. we you have um, this bill of materials. This bill of materials basically provides a cross-verified uh, list of uh, version of plugins. So for example, uh, there was a release 16 days ago, and this release includes um, basically a list of uh, uh, plugin versions which have been verified against each other so that we uh, launched the integration test, the functional test, and confirmed that plugins work with each other. You can see that there are some updates are completed in this release. And the idea is that instead of specifying versions explicitly in a plugin default plugin installation manager, you could refer this version so that uh, plugin installation manager takes versions from this file. So basically, you just uh, use uh, this file um, as a source of versions and do not define it explicitly. Yeah? Then if you decide that you want to update, you just say that instead of BOM version 26, I want uh, BOM version 27. And then plugin installation manager does all the installation of plugins okay. you need. All right. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry if I if come out as a new, but like bomb basically uh, is a like set of what I would say a set of two uh, dependencies which are released as with the new version of bomb. Is it is it like that? Yeah. Like, so I, I can uh, show you an example. Are you familiar with Maven? Sorry. Are you familiar with Maven? Uh, yeah, I have started using Maven. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. Oh, like, oh, like, I'm going to, I'm going to, to counter Himanshu's comment. I don't think I'm familiar with Maven, and I've used it for years. You should give a basic overview. <laughs> okay. Himanshu, yeah. no offense. I'm not trying to be offensive. Yeah, I, no, I'm just okay, saying actually, that. In, in uh, yeah, actually, I was very familiar with Maven. In any way, so please, no, no panic. Okay. So <laughs> there is an example of Jenkins plugin, Maven plugin. Here okay. we have basically dependencies on multiple plugin versions, Java libraries, etc. And here you can see that uh, we declare a list of dependencies. Some of the dependencies have explicit versions specified, for example, uh, Java X mail, instance identity, etc. So here you specify the version explicitly, and this is the version yeah. Maven will use. But for some uh, companies, you can see that the version is not provided. So, for example, display URL API plugin, JUnit plugin. Maybe something else in this list and show them. Yeah, for example, pipeline, etc. So these are also plugins we test with because there are pipeline steps we want to verify. And here there is no version specified. So this yeah. version actually comes from the bill of materials, which is defined in dependency management. So here we use oh. a bill of materials for Jenkins core baseline 2.235. So it's LCS baseline and version 26. Then when Maven uh, builds uh, the plugin, it takes uh, the list of dependencies from here. And basically, you can do the same for plugin installation manager. So instead of, uh, do I have an example? I guess here I still use plugins txt. Yeah, so plugins txt. So this is a file you can uh, actually feed to plugin installation manager. And you can see that uh, there are just 86 plugins I installed. And all these plugins mm -hmm. have versions, and it means that uh, somebody would have to manage these versions. It could be a manual way, you just go through the list, they install updates, or you could use automation tools. So, for example, uh, here, yeah, use the plugin installation manager to check for updates. 
So make file uh, uh, show updates. You can see that I just invoke plugin installation manager against this file, and it shows me the plugins I need to update. And after that, uh, yeah, I would still need to go to this file and patch them. Or once there is a command which patches them for me automatically, I could automate that. Well, I have it automated somewhere else, but yeah, it doesn't really matter. But uh, it would be much more easier for me to say that instead of all these dependencies, for the most of them, I don't really care about which version. I just want uh, the system to work. I could say that uh, please take uh, the version, let's say, of this uh, editor plugin, of pipeline plugins from bill of materials. So you don't manage it uh, on your own. Instead of that, uh, use uh, this uh, bomb which is already mm. cross verified and uh, for which you have some confidence that this uh, plugin set would work. And you don't manage it on your own, you just specify the version of the bomb. So instead of 30 dependency versions, you just have one. Okay, okay, okay. Now, mm. like, uh, I'm a little bit more clear about what's bomb. And... Okay. So, yeah, BOM is literally bill of materials. It's not a software engineering term originally, it's rather a generic uh, factory term. So, it, it's just a list of all materials you need to produce something. So, well, basically, the same in software now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As, as one of the shameless beneficiaries of the Jenkins plugin bill of materials, Himanshu, I'm all in favor of this technique and knowing about the technique eases the burden of people who maintain things. It's, it's impressive how much benefit I get from somebody else checking that parts and pieces work together well. And all I have to do is include, their, in, include that dependency on the bomb. And all, all, many, many of my versions just get handed for me automatically. So I'm not having to track every single one of them. Oh, yes, here's a good, good story to show. Yeah, and for the record, somebody uh, who is maintaining this session is mostly a uh, full dependent board and who the Jenkins building is for request. And then somebody just approving them after everything passes. Right. So mm -hmm. this part is automated as well. Great. So this means actually more work for the one who is like trying to find the, like trying to update from bomb and all that stuff, right? <laughs> like whoever is wishes to like go into this they'll have to do a lot of work. all right well, yeah it is that it is that there's a machine that so a, a program that generates these proposed changes and the continuous integration process evaluates them and if they pass yeah. they just get merged it's it's a very elegant 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 thing yeah that is a liable thing of course um, Ola, can you repeat that part again? Like, um, boom, how? Um, so there are thousands or millions of, let's say, software. So how boom is managing all of their um, versions? Um, how they are fetching? Okay, so bill of materials doesn't uh, manage all uh, hundreds of thousands of dependencies. It just manages mm -hmm. the dependencies it was asked to manage. So, for example, oh. here, if you go to bomb uh, latest, uh, let's see, you have a number of plugins which we stop. Mm -hmm. And for the record, it's not all Jenkins plugins. It's, it's a subset which continuously grows, uh, but it's a subset of plugins. And for each plugin, we have version. Um, and then basically, we have dependable board which verifies this file and uh, just uh, this one, the label in our maybe. Uh, but yeah, this is a specification you have. So it's not an extensive list, it's just a list of what was added to the bill of materials. So is it manually being updated by somebody or is it automated process? Uh, it was added manually originally, but the version update is automated. So what happens, oh. uh, yeah, Dependa Bot is one of the automation tools, part of the GitHub at the moment. It uh, checks uh, Maven repository, uh, and uh, if it sees any available updates, it submits a pull request. For example, here's a pull request which was submitted five days ago. It updates the matrix oh. position for you. And here you can see that uh, there are some release notes, so there was a security fix. Um, so what happens with that? It depends on what submits a pull request. Then Jenkins uh, gets uh, a notification from GitHub and starts the build. 
and uh, here you can see that the build has passed, so it was uh, automatic. And here you can see all the tests which were executed, ex uh, tests and uh, well, it's uh, test sets. You can see that everything is passing. So integration steps, steps are part of the plugins and Jenkins versions. Uh, you, if you need to see details, you can uh, navigate the Jenkins web interface. I believe that uh, yeah, so it's a bit hard check, but you can also see the results in motion, for example. So we have executed uh, uh, 21,000 uh, tests uh, in, from different plugins, from different components to verify this plugin. And yeah, then uh, when everything has passed, the Jenkins uh, shows a green key, so that maintainer can say that, okay, we passed all the test series, we can merge it. Uh, so mm -hmm. the merge is currently manual. So I mean, well, it's automatic, but uh, after approval of the person, we can make it fully automatic if you want, but in our current case, we still approve the request. So after each implementation, mm -hmm. the only job for maintainer is to just approve this full request and merge. Got it. Yeah. That, that much of human touch is required right? to like at the end, yeah, approve these changes. Okay, now you can use. Cool. Yeah. Mm, there is more automation possible. You can find projects and even components and Jenkins which have almost full continuous delivery. So, including automatic merge and automatic release after that. Uh, in, a, in the case of a bill of materials, it's uh, partially automated, but yeah, the most tedious part is automated. So just approving the change is nothing. And yeah, if needed, we could automate that as well. I just want to say um, thank you to Mark and Oleg. I know you guys are like keep doing presentation from past, I guess, now two hours. Uh, thanks for, yeah. Yeah, great yeah exactly. I wanted to see the same. You guys are doing fantabulous job. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Very kind. So I think we've reached reached our end. I was going to go ahead and yeah. stop the recording. Thanks very, very much, everyone. Um, we'll see, we'll do a Jenkins online meetup format next week and look forward to it. Now, Oleg, given the online meetup, will we also plan to hold these office hours next week? I think yes. Because okay, so we'll hours, be here as well during uh, office hours. I'd rather for dedicated questions. So great. All right. So see you next week, everyone. Thank you. And in the getter chats. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.